first Métis were children of indigenous women and European fur traders in the Red River area, now known as Manitoba. It dates back to as early as 1973 during the Alexander Mackenzie expedition. The Métis people developed their own language called Michiv, which is a unique blend of French and the Cree language that is still used today. Roughly 33% of all Canada's Aboriginal population is Métis. Métis means mixed. The Métis Nation Blue Infinity Flag is the oldest continuous used flag in Canada and it represents the mixing of two cultures. Métis were often called flower beadwork people due to their combination of French floral embroidery mixed with Aboriginal porcupine quilt work. Métis are well known for their finger woven sash, which is referred to as l'assumption sash, and it is the most recognizable symbol of Métis heritage. The sash was often used as a belt, tow rope, tump line, or even as a sewing kit. They're made of wool. Louis Riel was a Canadian politician, a founder of the province of Manitoba, and a political leader of the Métis people. He led two resistance movements against the government of Canada and its first prime minister, John A. Macdonald. Riel sought to defend Métis rights and identity as the Northwest Territories came progressively under the Canadian sphere of influence. Louis Riel Day is on November 16. The Métis Nation of British Columbia was founded in 1996 and is still going strong today. Well, Esther, first of all, thank you for participating in the Northeast BC Métis Storytelling Project. Um, this project is basically geared at sharing stories and wisdom uh, from elders, and uh, it's meant to uh, pass on these uh, stories to future generations or any current Métis citizens. So thank you for being a part of it. So can we start with your first and last name, please? What is it? Okay, Ilale, you're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Esther Jean Allen is my given names. I'm also traditionally known as Angasing Atagoyuk, as per my my father is Alaskan Inupiaq, that's where the Angasing comes in, and my mother is Okumiutasaya from Pangurtang Nunavut, um, which means place of the bull caribou. Wow, okay. Let's talk about your given names first, if that's okay. Uh, is there a reason why you were given those names? Any stories or anything? Uh, my traditional names, Angasing, was my grandfather's second wife. My grandfather is Foster Achuk Allen, and he had um, his mother, his first, his his father's first wife passed away, and he married Iksinak, and I was giving Angasing to honor my father's grandmother, and he gave that to me to pass on to my future generations. So my responsibility with that is to represent, learn where I come from, remember where I come from, and pass it on to other people who are interested, most importantly, our future generations. Be, the, be they Métis, Inupiaq, Okumiutasaya, we are all one people experiencing a one traumatic past, but we, we're gone through that and we're resilient and we're still here and it's I'm very very proud to be able to represent no matter where I live here in Canada I think our indigenous population has always been very open-minded and accepting and can you can you repeat your last name for me one more time please Atagoyuk the heritage of that do you know the heritage of Atagoyuk would be my mother's father uh, the tradition is, I was born in 1962. I always chuckle with my other cousins that have the same name because we've lost numbers of how many of us are named Ataguyuk. In Pangnaktuk, Nunavut, there is actually a school called Ataguyuk Ilisaksivik. He was a very renowned hunter. He begat many children. My mother was the youngest of the second wife he had. And I was, the year that he died was 1962. Oh, wow. So I am Ataguyuk, probably Ataguyuk, I was born in July. I would be Ataguyuk number seven if I were to be given a number. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. 
And what about uh, on your mom's side? No, that would be my mother's side, oh, Ataguyuk. Okay. Okay. On my father's side would be Angasing, would be the Inupiaq, would be Taktuk, my great-grandfather's second wife. Okay. And to carry on that tradition so that, you know, the names. Um, Do they mean something specifically? Angas, Ataguyuk, like I said, means place of the bull caribou. Right. Generally when it's not rutting season, the bull, the bulls always graze apart from the cows and the calves. So when it's not rutting season and they have no business being around the cows and the calves, they go off to their own place and that's what they call Ataguyuk, is place of the bull caribou. On my father's side, Angasing would be like an endearment, <laughs> I would think, from my understanding, because Anga would be in Inupiaq, I'm told would be yes. So she said yes a lot. <laughs> my father's uh, Inupiaq name, um, his first two siblings were born in Alaska. He was begat in Alaska and born in the Mackenzie Delta, and he was born in the springtime of the muskrat season. And the Umang uh name for muskrat is Kigbanluk. So he was given Kigbanluk. So he was born the year of the muskrating season. All right, well, you touched a little bit about um, <clears throat> where you were born, but can we maybe go down that sort of side of your story right now? Can you tell us where you were born um, and uh, I guess how long you lived there for that you remember? Okay, it was an adult is when I was learned I was a spontaneous birth in a Klavik Northwest Territories. Um, the doctor that I was seeing, and I would have been 43 years old, she was the doctor that had been in Inuvik for decades. She remembers my birth because she was an intern, just learning to be a doctor, and she happened to be in a clavic. And I was a premature, spontaneous birth, and I weighed just a little bit less than three pounds. Went to Inuvik. At that time, my father was working for the Dewline Station, and he was stationed in Hull Beach, Cape Perry, Cape Hope, which is on Baffin Island. So they would go back and forth to visit his family. So Agnes, my older sister, was born on a holiday in Aklavik. We went on holiday, and my mother was determined to have me back in Nunavut, but that didn't happen, so I was a spontaneous birth. And we ferried between Eastern Arctic and the Western Arctic before I went to school, and when I was ready to go to school, we moved permanently to Inuvik in the late 60s. And I stayed there up until grade eight, and I had an opportunity to move to Ontario to further my education based on an exchange trip we had. And uh, the family that I was, my twin in Ontario, they saw something in me and I, we returned home. My mother, my mom and dad, and my two sisters for some reason went on a boat trip and went to Herschel Island but they left me behind and then I got this letter in the mail and it had a plane ticket. And at that time we didn't have like telephone so I was on the VHF radio with my dad and he said, go. And I was 16, he said go and I went and I jumped on a plane from Aklavik, Inuvik, Edmonton, spent the night in Edmonton at that big airport stayed at that airport overnight, then I went to Toronto Pearson all by myself. And I was so afraid that that family wouldn't find me, but they did. Oh, good. And that's how I ended up in Ontario yeah. for my, sec my, my high school years and then my post-secondary years. And by that time, my parents moved back east. So I just moved to where my mother's bread was. Gotcha. But let's, maybe let's not go that far yet. Let's talk okay. about a little bit about Inuvik. First, you went to school there, right? Yes. Up until grade eight, is that what you said? Yes. What was that like? It was Inuvik. Uh, 
came about because a clavic was sinking into the delta and the federal government needed to establish a Canadian Forces base in the Mackenzie Delta. And the East Three branch of the Mackenzie Delta River is where they chose, away from the traditional community of a clavic. That was where they call it Silver City because that was there before Inuvik was formed. So they built Inuvik. Um, it was funny, they had their 50th anniversary the, when I turned 52. So I'm about the same age <laughs> as, we're about the same age. And when I was going in there, um, it was a pretty bustling time and pretty happening place and uh, pretty hard, hard living. Um, Dad was working in the oil field then, so we never saw him much and he was going through his stuff and things got hard and we were in and out of foster care for a while and then the residential school system kicked in and that was where my most of my formative elementary years were in first in the anglican run stringer hall which was run by a, a minister and his wife they closed that down and then uh, what it was we had two residential schools they had the roman catholic the grolier hall was a, administered by the Roman Catholic diocese. So they had priests and nuns administering that. Uh, we also had the Anglican Church administering the Stringer Hall. And the Stringer Hall accommodated, I don't know if it was because they were trying to acknowledge that we have two sets of indigenous people in this area. We have the Inuvialuit, Inupia, and then we also have the Denende and the Gwich'en Indian First Nations. So they put the Gwich'en and the Dene people from the surrounding area into the Grolier Hall, and they put us uh, from Inuvik, Aklavik, the surrounding area that were Inuvialuk, and they put us in the Stringer Hall. When they closed the Stringer Hall down, they integrated the both of us, which was a really fascinating experience because children being children, we threw rocks at each other and the dividing line was a utilidor. Because of the permafrost, we cannot have like sewage and water lines underground like what we have here. They have to be above ground and encased in all this steel and an aluminum. And behind our elementary school, you're facing the elementary school and on this side would be the Roman Catholic and on this side would be the Stringer Hall. And when the school was out, as we're marching our way back to our residence, we'd throw rocks at each other. But we would stop throwing rocks when we got into school because we were all in the same class as some of us. But once we were out those doors... Different story? Different story. And what was the experience like once you were in school? In the residential school or in the <coughs> elementary school? Let's do both. Let's talk about both. I was a junior, so I wasn't old enough to have a full recollection or be exposed to some of the horrendous, horrific activities that were going on after hours, especially with some of our older children and some of our younger children. But I was lucky enough not to be tarnished by that, but I remember thinking that's not right, but I couldn't say anything. Mm -hmm. So we withdrew within ourselves and we came to the point where we just adopted each other, children being children, being resilient. Um, you still have to learn how to braid your hair. Um, if you see somebody that needs help with, you know, whatever, braid their hair. Uh, take care of each other. I say I am the second daughter of three girls for my mom and dad. But my extended residential family, we are legion. And we still keep in touch. We still keep in touch to this day. That's nice. So, Rain, I forgot to ask earlier, but I'm glad you mentioned it there. So you're one of three? Is yes. I am the middle child. Of how many girls, sorry? Three. Three girls? There's Agnes, Mary, Pamuk, Esther Jean, Angasing, Ataguyuk, Rosemary, Ukjuk. There's the three of us. Of the three of us, I am like my father. 
My sister Agnes was born in the Northwest Territories, lived, raised her children, still lives in the Northwest Territories. My younger sister was born in Nunavut, stayed in Nunavut, lived and raised her children in Nunavut. I, on the other hand, am nomadic, very nomadic, like my father. I am like my father, have post-secondary education. I am like my father, I am survivor of two residential school systems. But I'm also have had the blessing to be blessed to have a beautiful butterfly, I call my mother, who is unilingual, and I'm very proud of her, very, very proud of her. I have been blessed and lucky enough to have a foundation that is so shaky, so broken, but they still have remnants of themselves that they've passed on to me and I've hung on to, and I'm nurturing that in my own way. Good. And <clears throat> what languages were uh, primarily spoken at home? English. We never had a home. We had a place we were housed. We were housed. Um, there's no two ways about it. At the, when we were home, my mother never spoke her language because there was nobody else around that spoke her language. So she had to struggle with broken English. But English, for the most part, was spoken at home from my recollection. But my mother reminded me again, right from baby till toddlerhood. And those were the formative years. And I've learned to recognize that's the hippocampus neurogenesis thing that's happening in the toddler's brain. And I... She put that in there, and I never knew that. All my teenage years, you know, my adolescent teenage years, my early adult years until I moved back to the Eastern Arctic was when I started speaking the baby Inuktitut, and they helped me nurture that to where I'm fluent now. So my house is, is bilingual. For the most part, it's English because my, my husband only speaks English. Um, but if I'm speaking to my extended family in Nunavut or in the Eastern Arctic, the whole language is in Inuktitut. A lot of laughing. Yep. That's nice. And um, can you tell us a little bit, little bit about, uh, you mentioned it a bit, but perhaps elaborate what your parents did uh, for work when you were uh, growing up? Yep. Um, my father attained a seventh grade education. Um, in 1957, he started a carpentry course. I'm not sure if it was in a Klavik or in Inuvik, but he started that in 57, and then that same, he completed that course. He started a heavy duty mechanic apprenticeship program in Leduc, Alberta. In 57, he completed that. He started for the due line, and that's when the due line saw something in my dad where they said, become an electrician, and my dad said, okay. So he's in trades with a seventh grade education. My mother also was a part of my education, although I didn't know it at that time. She couldn't read or write in English. She was never formally educated but she was a haute couture seamstress, meaning she sewed made to measure. What I am wearing here was made to measure specifically for me by my achang, my, my father's sister. And she made this for me because she knew green was my favorite color. And I think that is such a skill that we have overlooked, and my mother had that in spades. I have pieces of, I have a winter coat that's going on 32 years old, wow. and I still wear, and I've worn it here a couple of times. It's just not cold enough right now. So my, and, and she was also responsible for passing on the language to me. She couldn't, she didn't pass it on to Agnes. She tried to, but it didn't take my older sister. So I'm blessed to have a, a foot in both worlds and I've been blessed to have a father who was intrepid, resourceful, strong, 
and he learned how to speak in Inuktitut. Oh, good for him. Officially then, what cultural group do you then, uh, I guess, associate with? I guess you have two, don't you, in a, in a way? Or just one on your dad, like on the one from Nunavut? You said you, you kind of uh, associate with your mom and your dad's both, but is there one or more so that you associate with? If I had to choose one, would that be the question that you would be asking? Sure. If I had to choose one, I would choose both. Okay. And why is that? I think it's because I have, um, and I'm just learning this history, my own family history, and I'm almost 60, I have to say. And I'm just starting to learn and realize uh, for a long time I was, if I was in the Eastern Arctic, I was from the Western Arctic. If I was from the Western Arctic, I was from the Eastern Arctic. And I acknowledge both. I don't try to defend the other one to the other one. I just choose to say where I am to right now. So I'm in British Columbia, um, learning about the Métis people because they've, I've, I've heard about them and I've, I've read about them in the history books, but I've never met them in person. And they're, I thought I had it bad. I've been a hybrid, being uh, Inupiaq, uh, Inuk from the Eastern Arctic, Inupiaq from the Alaskan. But, you know, I look at the Treaty 8 tribal association. That has a little bit more uh, of a dialectal, there's, there's eight associations within the, this Treaty 8, right? Mm -hmm. I only have two. And they both speak a language that we can understand, but the dialectal difference is, that's the only difference is the dialectal difference. The home values, uh, respect the earth, respect your elders, nurture the young, look after the land. Whether you are Métis, Inuk, Portuguese, I don't care if you live in Canada, we are a, 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 a nation that have first peoples and we are, uh, I belong to the Inuvalid Regional Corporation, but before that was established and that um, land claims agreement was signed, they had called themselves COPE, Committee of Original Peoples Entitlement. And living extensively across Canada, not only in the North and, and being involved with First Nations people from Oka, from Brantford, uh, here or in the Northwest Territories, we are the Committee of the Original People's Entitlement. So I identify as Indigenous to Canada. My heritage of, is Inuk but I identify with indigenous populations all across this planet. We, are, we have the same values, we have the same um, ways to, to nurture and respect our surroundings, air, earth, water. We have the same values. It's just our languages may be different, our appearances may be different, our clothing and apparel may be different, but at heart and deep within our soul, we have a connection to Mother Earth, and we honor and respect that in different ways. No human being. Absolutely. I don't care if you're even from Portugal. You, you know, I'm just using that in as, as an example because they have their own way of dress, and they have their own way of honoring and traditions. But the underlying thing and the similarity is the values are very much the same. That's right. Okay, thank you for telling us about that, by the way. Um, can we move on to your high school years? Because that's, if I'm not mistaken, from what I remember you are saying, you, then we're in Ontario? Paris, Ontario. Paris, Ontario. Um, we, we lived in my, my uh, what's that word? The people that took me in from when we had that student exchange trip, they're my, 
you know, when you're playing hockey and you're playing in a different town, you have a, a family that looks after you. Oh, they're not. Um, oh my goodness, what? I don't know the word that you're trying to say. Yeah. Billet. Billet. Well, yeah, something similar to that. Um, they lived in Drumbo, Ontario, and I spent, that was my first time in Ontario, was when I was in that student exchange trip, and my eyes were like this big. First time I'd ever touched a cow. First time I'd ever ridden a horse. Uh, first time I'd ever seen a, an 18-wheeler up close and like, I'm on the bus. And you know how high the bus is, eh? And I'm still like looking like this, and, I'm, and then when I see all the wheels, and I'm like, oh my gosh, and look how fast they're going. My, those were my, my junior high school years uh, in Paris, Ontario. And what about your senior ones? Same thing, Paris, Ontario. Yep. Did it all there. Yep. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with southwestern Ontario, but there's Drumbo, Paris, and then there's Brant County, because we were in Oxford. Brant County is is where they, it's Brantford, Ontario, and they have quite a big reserve there. And uh, when I found that out and was mobile enough, I would go visit the reserve and I just feel like I was part of the pack. And when I heard the drums, it was just like I was back home again. It was a learning experience that was the first time I'd ever been able to fully feel freely enough to express Esther Jean Allen is who I am. Here I am, and this is what I think, and this is what I'm going to say. Because in Inuvik, and, you know, right from elementary school years, and being in the residential school system, it's very, very regimented. It's a regiment. It's like you're in the army. When I moved to Ontario, and I didn't have the other people around me judging me, telling me what to do, what not to do, what to say, what not to say, I had the freedom to express myself. And I remember that, and what a light feeling that was. But little did I know how ignorant I was, because I did, had no idea who I was, where I came from. I didn't know where my mother came from. I didn't know where my dad came from, because they never spoke about that. So it was just learning that it's okay to, to put your hand up and say, uh, this is what I think. But it's also too, and I remember, and I'm sure you go through the same thing, remembering your junior and senior high years. You know, you, you have that, you're nurturing and you're developing that way of communicating and delving into, you know, algebra. Oh my gosh, even today, I manage a 36 unit apartment building and, if, and the math still hurts me, but I remember in algebra and I remember thinking, I'm never gonna use this and I never did and I still don't understand it and I try to help my kids, can't, no. <laughs> math hurts me too much. But I remember it's that freedom of, of expression that I, and that, that oppression I was away from. I was away from from the foster care system, away from the residential school system, away from the social workers, away from the bullies, the Guchin and the Dene bullies, you know, away from all that, it, everything was so oppressed. But when I left that, it was just, I blossomed, I crashed and burned quite a few times, but I'm still here and by the grace of God, my mother went back to the Eastern Arctic and. She said, just grow up. And I did, and that's when I started my post-secondary. In Ontario? In Ontario was recreational leadership of all things. Why did you choose that? Because it was easy. It looked like fun, it was. It was just learning crafts and, you know, if you're working in a swimming pool and you need activities for seven days a week and you have to have activities and set the pool up for elder swimming, tots, you know, open swim, you know, or crafts, um, 
I volunteered in an extended care uh, home in London and I help with their recreational program. And it's just sitting there, just having, helping them to pass the time. And we made a few Alzheimer pillows, you know, for the people that have Alzheimer's and it, they're very tactile. So it's always, I've always been blessed to have been involved in things and been around people that have helped me. I acknowledge it now, but I was healing and learning how to heal and be around people that have their best, my best interests at heart, rather than the regiment, which is, uh, you're not a person, you're W31911. So you went out for post-secondary, where did you go? After post-secondary, I followed my mom's bread. She moved back to Broughton Island, Kikitaktoak. She left my father. And for two years, they were separated. And then he went back home. He went through counseling. And then um, I moved back home to be with my mom and my dad. And I needed a job. I left the two children behind with the paternal grandparents in Ontario because they, they would be so alien and I wanted them to have an education that was better than what I have. And my oldest son, Joshua, is a carpenter and has been a carpenter all his life. He's single. My, my bossy daughter, Sarah, is a teacher and she's university educated but they're both ignorant, cannot read, write, or speak in any language, but they have the post-secondary skills. The other two, my other two sons, I made a conscious decision to raise them in Nunavut. They can read and write in syllabics, but they cannot do anything post-secondary because they do not have the post-secondary skills. So they're in general manual labor. But they can, they're fluent. <laughs> now, you had your first two children in Ontario mm -hmm. and then the other two in, in Nunavut. Nunavut. Gotcha. Okay. Now, um, I guess after talking about, you know, all of your childhood and maybe even your, I guess, your younger years, what would you say is one story uh, or a memory that will always stick out for you as something special that you enjoyed from growing up? My childhood? Yeah. I have, a, a, I, I have, I don't have one specific memory. I have a bunch of fragmented good memories where if my parents had custody of us and we were out on the land, my happiest, happiest memories are there. Because dad is sober, dad is clean, mom is not hurting, Rosemary and I are there and we're hunting and harvesting. And I remember, actually I have one really good memory when we were walking along the Mackenzie River and dad got some willows and he made me a bow and arrow. And he had some, um, I don't know what kind of string it was, but I remember it was such a good day and that was when he was teaching me how to, to hunt. Um, and as I grew up, um, we always had an opportunity, any opportunity he had, and like I say, they were very fragmented. He took those times to teach me and pass on to me what he was taught and how to harvest and hunt. And being a, a girl daddy, <laughs> I guess I was the one that just looked, sounded, and I was always his sidekick. So he taught me that. As a child living in the Western Arctic, it was very fragmented. But when I became an adult, it was a little bit longer because we were in Nunavut, dad was sober. I lived all over Baffin Island. Um, he taught me how to hunt and harvest in the Eastern Arctic. And my happiest memories 
have always been in the Mackenzie Delta, Shingle Point, uh, West Channel in the Eastern Arctic. In the Western, in the Eastern Arctic, it would be Kikitagoruk, um, Padli, Pangnakto. Um, uh, those outpost camps and also you know on the sea ice you know because it was a lot of seal hunting and stuff and my happiest memory there would be dad showing me the skill he had just learned and mastered was hunting with a seal blind a white seal blind you're out on the sea ice and you you see a seal you could see it's a black dot and he'd come so far and mom and dad were there it was just the three of us and dad gave me the blind and he said this is what you need to do so they're watching me and it took me a good 45 minutes and i'm creeping along eh and this the it was such a beautiful day i put the blind down and i'm on my knees and i'm getting my rifle put the blind down and i'm getting myself situated and I'm looking behind and mom and dad are still there. Okay, good. <laughs> Just as I'm going to cock the gun, my seal blind fell over. <laughs> so the seal would just went boop. And there's mom and dad. Mom was just beside herself laughing. My dad, not so much. He was a little bit <laughs> disappointed because he really wanted me to beg one. Yeah. But he was like, it's, I did everything right up until the point where, you know, you have to, as you're going along, you just kind of nurse it along. But once you're going to take your shot, you have to plant it. And I didn't plant it. So. And that's why I blew away from your cancer. That's why it blew away. Yeah. Too bad. So did you keep hunting later on throughout the years as an adult? Mm-hmm. Did you pass that on to your children? No. How come? There is no interest in that. Um, the, the two older children are in Ontario. The foster, my foster, uh, my son Foster is in Abbotsford. Um, my son Robert lives in Edmonton and we never really, I've always had that opportunity to, well, my husband first was a white man and he didn't know how to hunt. So if we went camping, it was recreational camping and it was just not something that, you know, I felt like. I could pass on to them because we really weren't practicing at that, practicing it at, at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, we're still involved with our local HTOs and, you know, everybody shares their catch. And, you know, if we catch fish, then we share our fish. And, you know, it's, it's just something I knew and recognized that, you know, these two boys are not interested in. Yeah, it makes it harder once they're not, the interest from them is not there. Yeah. That's fair. Okay. That was the onset of technology, I have to say. That was the beginning. I remember the Sega, the Nintendo, the Xbox. Yeah. Very, very started changing times. Tough to compete with that when it, when it came to uh, teaching traditions or playing games to get their attention. Absolutely. And I had an opportunity where I could put food on the table just by going to the grocery store or ordering because I've always been employed. I've always been working. So subsistence hunting was something that I didn't have to because I am educated and I've always been able to find work and I've worked all my life. Can you tell us a little bit about, about your uh, professional career? Where have you worked? Like, what did you do for a living? Okay, so uh, I have a recreational leadership diploma. Then after that, I got a community aerodrome certificate where I could work at the local airport and be the, the support and standby for aircrafts and pilots and do weather observing. And then I had an opportunity and I thought, oh, 
I need, I can't sit in an airport and just take weatherly observations and the rest of my day I'm doing this. So I took a business management two-year diploma course in Iqaluit. Um And then I started working at the Northern store, which is like the legacy grocery store, but it's like a chain all across the north. And I started my way in the office. Then I worked my way up to grocery uh, associate, retail associate, and then I made my way up to where I was managing my own store in Kimmegot Nunavut. And part of my duties was to pick up the groceries in a one ton from the airport. And I was expecting my last child and after I couldn't hand bomb the boxes, um, I went into the non-government sector where I worked with community wellness programs, education programs, cultural programs. Um, and all through the north, you know, uh, this was on Baffin Island. Um, that was 11 years I did that, community wellness, working with NGOs and, you know, healing programs and elder day programs and uh, on the land programs. And I was always involved with a district education authority. Um, it's always been some sort of management. And then when I lost my mom, I lost, dropped my basket and then I just went into housekeeping. I needed a job. I wasn't going to go on welfare because I know what, what that is like as a child growing up and I swore I never would do that. So I went into housekeeping and always made my way up to supervisor and now we're here and I'm managing a 36 unit apartment building going on five years now and it's liaising, you know, I have head office in Coquitlam but I also do payroll, I do rental agreements, you know, I've always, I've always, I guess I've used up my diploma, my business management diploma is in tatters because I've used it so long and so often and for a myriad of things. I've also worked with our own Inuvalut Regional Corp, which is our Lance Claim um, Association, and I worked with that. That's really cool. You had a variety of jobs and yes. you've been exposed to lots then. Yes. That's really nice. Now, growing up, who would you say uh, was the individual that uh, influenced you the most? The individual that influenced me the most was my dad. Good, bad, and ugly. But he was my biggest influencer right from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. I was daddy's girl, but he also passed on the knowledge that he had amassed and, and nurtured through the years, and he's passed that on to me. I would say he's my biggest influencer. My second would be my mom. She's shown the gentle, more accepting, you know, she is of the harvester tribe where Dad and I are of the hunting tribe, you know? And anybody outside of them, did you meet any elders along the way that have uh, maybe taught you any traditions or any great lessons? There's more than a handful from Nunavut, from my community wellness days. There is a couple from the eastern, western Arctic side, um, there's one in particular from Rankin Inlet. His name was Mariano Aupilaku. Um, this was my community wellness days. And he wasn't focusing on how to fix people. His whole thing was to remind us what we had forgotten. And I never forgot that. He's not here to fix people. That I'm a, not a doctor. I'm not a counselor. But he, what he was there was to remind me of the thousands of years of knowledge and practice that we have forgotten or that was taken away from us. And being an elder, um, he also told me, you know, he was 18 once, 
and at that time it was arranged marriages, but he still had the wandering eye, but he never followed through with that wandering eye. But he still had those thoughts and urges, and he was open and honest enough to say, this is where the line was drawn by mom and dad, because I'm to marry on this side. Those people that I'm looking at, no. He might look and think, but no, he was, no. And for me, that was such a profound thing because when you see an elder, all you see is, is an elder, but you never realize they were newborn, like we all are, we're born helpless and naked into this world. And out of this world, we shall go helpless and naked. It's what we do in between which is important and lasting. But you have to do it in a way that respects the person that you're doing it with, and you have to respect that they have boundaries, and you have guidelines, and it's up to you, even though your mom is still not there to say, no, -uh. she's still in my head and in my heart to say, and she, all, she never called me daughter, my mother. She always called me atat which is a short, form, a short form of saying father. She always addressed me as a dad. Do you know, do you know why? Because that was, I was, she named me after her dad. So she always called me dad. When I go to Pangertung, I'm not Esther. I'm grandpa, uncle, brother, nephew. And I am treated and honored as such. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, I am a Dawuyuk. I am strong, I am resourceful in a different way. And that was a long process for me to acknowledge and to say thank you for saying such because we don't we never hear you're doing such a good job or you know you did really good today in the regiment you're you're nothing, and you're treated as such, and you're spoken to as such. Mm -hmm. But when you're doing it from a family perspective, even though I'm a stranger to Pangertung, because I never grew up in the Eastern Arctic, it wasn't until I was an adult I went there, they still treated me with the same respect and dignity they would bestow upon as if my grandfather was there. And oh, I was told, I, my grandfather is here because I'm here. So it behooves me and it, it's my responsibility no matter where I am in Canada. And I've been blessed and lucky enough to experience, you know, from an indigenous perspective, all that I have experienced. But I brought that on to myself too. But it's always with that knowledge that this is where I come from. I finally know. I'm almost 60, and I'm finally knowing this stuff, which should, I should have been brought up with all along. But I'm lucky enough to be around people, you know, Valerie and the people here in Hudson's Hope. I mean, we live by the river. We have one school, kindergarten to grade, eight, grade, to grade 12. We have a health center. We have one store, one post office. It's my hometown living, and I've, I've always had that. I've never had any. I was wide-eyed in Ontario, but it really wasn't for me. I needed to be where it was a little bit less populated, densely, and by the river. I mean, that's where I was born and raised, my formative years. I'm a river rat. <laughs> Fair enough. <clears throat> and um, okay, well, I think that covers a lot of your, I guess, your your life growing up and with your parents and who your influences were. Now let's talk about um, your involvement in the community. Did you uh, volunteer in any for any organizations, or did you uh, partake in any, you know, uh, specifically here or, in Hudson's Hope or any any time along your life? Always, I've always been, you know, sports minded. I played hockey, I played volleyball back in the day, and, you know, I'd, I'd be involved in 
community sports and, and tournaments and traveling within the territory. That was my teenage young adult life until I, I grew into, after my, my business diploma program, um, I became involved at that time. Um, Lloyd Axworthy was the minister for children education of children, it was a child, he had the childcare portfolio. I needed daycare at that time, and there was no daycare in Pond Inlet. Um, my second year of diploma, I became involved in the childcare, in the childcare board where my, my son went to the childcare center at the elementary school in Iqaluit, and I became a board member, and I, at that time, the uh, federal government had that package where they made um, funds available to build, actually build centers rather than just for programming, and they did it all across the north. So I was on that board, and at that time, there was no Nunavut. I represented all of the Northwest Territories uh, nationally, and that was my first real rubbing elbows with the First Nations community and we are but a percentage for the First Nations. And just think of it, it was a national First Nations, and here was one tiny little Inuk person representing all of the Northwest Territories. So that was my first experience with the non-government sector. And then early childhood became very much a passion for me, especially when you know, I became involved in community wellness and when I really recognized and saw that hippocampus and hearing from all these healthcare professionals talking about the early neurological development of children. And I'm living proof of that because my mother instilled in me my, her language from a very young age when my little neurons were doing their thing. So it, how you treat the children I recognized too early on, it's not just the children we have to focus, the parents and the adults need the support because we were so broken back then, and we still are, but we're starting to heal a little bit. So I have been invited to throw my hat into, you know, local politics and those kinds of things, and, and I tried that for a while, and my niche is to be the thorn of in the side rather than at the other side of the table because we are so sadly misrepresented on this side of the table. Yeah, fair enough. Well, that's good that you've been able to be part of those boards and those communities and those organizations. Yep. What about here in actually in, in Hudson's Hope? Have you gotten involved into? Uh... Yeah, um, actually with uh, Val at the school, we've, uh, she's invited me on a few occasions when we have Aboriginal Day. And I'm hoping given, you know, when this COVID crisis eases a little bit, um, we become involved a little bit more concretely in terms of, you know, what's been happening with the day Indian residential school grave sites and, and acknowledging, you know, all the wrongs and all the turmoil in that. But I believe there are some rights that have happened. But for the now, let's focus on bringing the children home, um, you know, and I, I'm not sure what that process is, but let's just be, every day I, I spend a couple of minutes in silence and I just, because I know and I've been there being at that age and being amongst the masses of the brown haired, dirty, bedraggled, good for nothing, or so we thought, and we were treated as such, but we're not. It's. Yeah, and she's invited me for those programs, um, and I do the the programming from kinder. I have it available from kindergarten right up to grade twelve, and those kids are so open and so they're just an open book. So, you know, I a couple of there's a couple of the older classes where I actually took the Roman orthography or the the syllabics, which is 
the written system that was introduced to the Eastern Arctic by the Jesuits. Interestingly enough, when I went to that museum, they used, they used syllabics here, and that was introduced by the Jesuits. So I introduced a little bit of what I knew of my writing system to the school, and I, I made name tags for all of the kids. And um, yeah, I'm not known as Mrs. Gordon or Esther, I'm Atagoyuk. I always have the children address me as Atagoyuk. Wow. Yeah. And I look forward to being involved more in, in those things. I really think, you know, our younger generation is, is losing out on a history that um, the only history that they're going to know and hear, especially for the older kids, is the grave sites and the trauma and this, that, and the other thing. But I want them to see an actual residential survivor who is kind of okay, culturally, um, steady. Now that I know who I am and where I come from, um, a little bit broken or not. I'm bent but not broken and I think that's what the kids need to see. I mean, you know, the, some of the older kids, you know, they say, you know, Esther, you're so different and, you know, they've been in Vancouver and some of the older kids have seen Skid Row or wherever they call it down there and they say, we need to hear more from people like you. Well, I'm no different than those people down in those streets. My path just took me somewhere else. I'm just as broken as they are, but, you know, I have a support system that have brought me to here, and I'm part of that support system, by the way. So, uh, aside, well, not aside, but in addition to the support system that you've had, thankfully, throughout the years, what would you say has helped you get through all those tough times? My secret happy place, I withdraw. I think that's, that's a, a, a learned uh, survival mechanism I developed very early on, probably grade one, grade two. And I just go back to that happy place. Um, and anger, righteous anger. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is, is I have a voice. I've always had it, and I'm not muzzled anymore. And I'm free to, to express, but I'm also have that responsibility to say, okay, because this happened doesn't excuse me from trying to be good, do good, and I'm not a tax on the system. I'm paying into the system, and I joke to my husband, I'm going to be 60, and I've been invited by the federal government to, to take early retirement. You know what? I'm going to do it. I've been working since 82. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And um, can you tell me a little bit about uh, what role perhaps spirituality or ceremony play in your life, if any? Absolutely. It's, it's the idea that we have but one Mother Earth. We have the sister ocean, the father sky. They are our family. Like I take care of my sister, Rosemary, best way I could. It is my responsibility to take care of the family that's taken care of me, providing food from the land, from the sea and from the air. Um, be good, do good. Know where you're from and don't be afraid to ask questions. Even down here when I'm talking to some people around here, they have no idea what their history is. And I think that's just something that we should be a little bit more curious and more open to those kinds of questions about who am I? Where did I come from? Or maybe that's just my perspective because my who am I is so much bigger than, you know, my cousins from my mother's side who have been, and I envy that, they were born and raised and lived and died in their community. For me, I'm kind of going all over the place. Yeah. You've gotten to see lots. Oh, yes. So that makes up for some of that. Yes, I think the, the fabric of my life, the colors are vibrant. 
that are tattered in some places, but I think overall the fabric of my life has been pretty colorful. The patterns have changed significantly, significantly, and I'm not as tattered as I used to be. If that's a good analogy. Um, well, with all of that um, in mind, um, thank you for sharing all of this, by the way. It was very interesting. For any future generations that may watch this, what message would you uh, want to pass on to anyone that's watching this in, let's say, five or ten years from now? In five or ten years from now for the, for the younger generation? We have but one earth, and I think our earth right now is hurting. And we need to look after our mother earth. Uh, we see the floods, we've seen the fire. Um, no ice in the bay in Kimmerod. In it's almost December. Uh, I hope we have 10 years from now. That's my dark, that's where I go on my dark days. On my brighter days, 10 years from now, um, I'm hoping for the younger generation that they have a more deeper, they have an understanding of who they are and be proud of where they come from and to start to develop and nurture the inner native, no matter where you are. But no one recognized that, you know, we are not isolated hamlets. We are not isolated uh, communities. We are not outpost camps. We are a global, global nation. And I hope and pray that the younger generation would be able to represent our indigenous population a little bit better than I am doing right now because their education path was a little bit easier than mine where they were able to stay with their parents. But it's also too that I hope our younger generation has a government that is a little bit more understanding of our indigenous population where they have to acknowledge that whole system, that colonialism was meant to eradicate the native in all of us. We're still here. We're still proud. We weren't for a long time, and I want them to have that proud, that pride to be indigenous, where I didn't have that as a young person. And I go down the road of what if? What if I was not as broken as I was when I was 22? I could have, you know, could have cured cancer. <laughs> I, you know, I think sometimes, but then God and mom nudge me and say, that's what if you don't dwell on that. You do what's, what's right here in front of you. And you do it in a way that's steadfast and in your language. And acknowledge your elders because they had a hard row to hoe on becoming elders. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Again, thank you for being part of the project. Oh, <laughs> I'm just glad I had the opportunity and, you know, glad that Valerie called me. And um, like I say, I'm always ready to represent, but I'm also ready to, to share and sit beside, you know, somebody that had the same path as me, but it was in a different time and different area, but where the commonalities are still there.